Great. Good morning, everyone, or evening or afternoon, depending uh, where you are in the planet. Welcome for the first session of this summer crash course on feminist and ecological macroeconomics. Today we are with session three, which is on macroeconomics uh, modeling with Andrzej Czeplinski, who is a researcher at the University of Pisa, and Cemo Vyat, who is a senior lecturer in economics at the University of uh, Greenwich. Um, as usual, as in the other days, we will have a conversation between the two of them, not me flying, but it's just the camera who fell off. Um, we'll have a conversation between the two, and then we will be um, posing the questions from uh, the participants. So let's get started with uh, modeling without further uh, delay. I think we have been uh, building up you know, in the first two days, introducing the topics of feminist and ecological macroeconomics. Yesterday, we heard also a lecture on post keynesian economics, which I think is pretty um, fundamental also to understand the models on which Cem and Andre uh, are working on. You have watched the lectures so that we can uh, get into the topic. I think, uh, obviously, everybody knows that models are not perfect or not the, the response to all the questions, but I think they can really help us out to structure a little bit our uh, thoughts and they're a good exercise. And it's a good opportunity, I think, to do empirical research and obviously it's not the, the only one. I think to put it, uh, rephrasing, so to say, the words of Andre, I think we could say that one of the questions of today's session is how are different variables of the economy connected with the environment and with gender uh, equality? No? And I think both Cem and, and Andre um, help us out um, to get uh, some ideas. I am no doubt that there will be many questions for clarification, uh, and please uh, start already posting them in the Q&A uh, session. As usual, we will start with Andre and Cem doing a short summary of their lecture and then next a comment on each other's lecture. So without further delay, Andre, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for being here today together. Thanks. Okay. Uh, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's been a pleasure for me to, to be here. And I would also like to apologize for the very long lecture, which I realized after having checked some of the other ones. But hopefully by now, um, most of you will have watched it in 1.25, 1.5 speed, and then it will become like a one hour lecture. And before I, I try to summarize what I did in the, in the class, I would like to say two things. So I see that the questions are going already and um, I see how they managed to, to do a good job in summarizing it and passing them to us afterwards, but inevitably some of them will not will be left and, and not properly answered. So I do encourage you to, if your question was not answered uh, on my part during the lecture today, to paste it on Slack and I'll try to go back to it afterwards and maybe answer it uh, for text. And also one thing I mentioned during my recorded class is that we will talk about um, talk about software and how to, to start modeling, what to use. I don't know if we will have time here due to the format and discussion, but have also added a new, uh, a very brief document to Slack with some links, important links and resources that you might find interesting to start modeling and some software you can download and start using. Also some examples you can, you can you know, download and see a, a properly done model or example before you start doing your own. Um, so as Federico said already during my lecture, what I, my intent was to walk you through a model. So, uh, and I wanted to do it walking you through a model that had a bit of everything that we usually have or would like to have in an ecological macro model. And that's why I chose um, Professor Lafermo's work as the main reading for this lecture, because I think it's relatively simple on one side, but also fairly complete on the other. And then I added some stuff to it, such as the, the input output part. And then before we walked through all the equations and, and which took perhaps a bit too long, I tried to, went, to go a little deeper onto, um, I don't know, well, maybe like two of the main um, 
tools in the toolbox of, of ecological macro post engine modeling, which are input output and um, stock flow consistency. And I highly encourage you if you ever want to, to start um, either just reading and understanding someone else's model or doing one of your own, if they have the, the matrices, to start by looking at the stock flow consistent matrices because they will show you um, the dimension of the model, whether the, all the constraints are respected, whether things are interconnected or how they are interconnected or not. And yeah, so the, the, the last thing I just wanted to say is that during the, well, while we were going through the, the example model we had, I have added just two very simple feedbacks from environment to economy through investment and consumption. Usually there are, or there could be many, many, many more. Um, some of which are very common, some of which are not very well understood already, but I just wanted to make this clear. Usually you could have effects of temperature increase on productivity of labor productivity. You could have effects on health, which could translate into effect on productivity. You could have, um, and there's a big empirical econometric literature on this, um, effects on migration, and then therefore also to the labor market, labor supply being increased in some countries, decreased in others. And there, there might also be effect through actual scarcities of relevant materials that are used for renewable energy sources. Um, it's just, well, this is just to say that the, the amount of complexity you can add in a model is almost infinite. Uh, and usually you don't want to add all of it. You, you just want to add what serves your purpose. But I think this kind of summarizes, I would pass to Jan and thanks for your lecture. I found it very interesting and I look forward to discuss it in a bit. Excellent, thanks a lot, Andre, Jan. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so thank you for inviting me for this uh, lecture series. First of all, I think it's a, a great organization. Uh, I'll basically summarize what I tried to do in the uh, in my own uh, lecture. Uh, I tried to first um, explain why uh, making macro models gendered, why including the gender dimension might be important, and how it could contribute us uh, understanding the uh, economy. Uh, I. We fo I focus on mainly, uh, there are of course different types of work, but uh, I focus mainly on our work with uh, Onaran and uh, Fotopoulou, uh, which we try to uh, build a post Kaletskian uh, feminist uh, macroeconomic model. And the aim of uh, this model was two things. First of all, trying to explain uh, the impact of uh, reducing gender gaps on growth and employment, but not only that, also like the policies that would close the uh, gender gaps in the economy. So it worked like kind of both ways. Uh, in the post models that I explained, like the, you see the economy as capitalists and workers, and here uh, we included a gender dimension. So we made like capitalists, male and female workers. And why uh, this is important is that we said, they might have different, uh, the female and male workers might have different consumption patterns, which might have different impacts on uh, output and, and productivity. And also policies, uh, specifically uh, social infrastructure uh, investments, which generates uh, what's called uh, purple jobs, greater jobs for women, uh, ha also have impacts on uh, output and uh, productivity. Uh, so based on this framework, we try to understand what could be the mechanisms of uh, different policy shocks on uh, employment, growth, and uh, closing gender gaps, basically. Uh, I'll, I'll finish the summary for now. Great, that is fantastic. I think it helped us to refresh a little bit your uh, lectures. And I think we can now start with the conversation between the, the two of you. So I would ask um, Andre um, to uh, start with the comments uh, to Chemo Ivat. I guess one of the big questions of today is how to merge ecological and feminist macroeconomics models, but let's go step by step. So please, 
you go, Andre. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks again. Thanks again, Jim, for the lecture. Um, so this comment here stems from uh, the realization that I had by watching your, your recorded class and thinking, reflecting about mine, that perhaps um, these two classes are maybe a bit out of the comfort zone for many of those um, watching. So I would like to ask you whether you could, um, first of all, clarify how specifically some of your results um, follow from the uh, some of the specific hypotheses that you that you present in your in your works, but in in the work you sent uh, as the main reading specifically, and. I would like you to comment on that specifically because I think even for those that are not usually, well, are not used to reading models or don't do that for, for a living or have never done that during, during university or uh, education or work in general, uh, you should be aware that even if you don't really understand everything, if you pay very good attention to all the hypotheses people are making before they start doing crazy, amounts of equations and, and solving them, usually you can understand how those um, lead to some of the results they get. So specifically, I would like, so your results are very, um, you know, very positive, right? So you found that, for instance, the, the UK economy tends to be wage and gender equality led, which would be actually great, right? So it would tell you that if you actually do um, policies that favor gender equality and that increase the living standards of workers it probably would improve the general uh, material condition of, of the population. You also find large multipliers in output and employment for investment in, in what you call the social sector. Um, but I would like to understand specifically what is the relation of these results to the fact that um, well, to differences in marginal propensities to consume between uh, males and females, and more specifically to the hypothesis that the composition of employment, if I understood well, is fixed during the industries, in the industries, right, by the, the coefficient beta. So is it that when you, when you increase uh, wages of female workers, there is less of a profit squeeze in, in the model, and that's why you have better effects than you would have like increasing male wages, for instance. And finally, I would like you to, to comment if you can, or maybe I would like to discuss with you uh, what would change if we had some, um, some, some very common hypotheses, I think that are kind of missing, but would probably add a lot of complexity. So I, I don't even know if it's, um, fit for a model like this, but if you had, um, so if the increasing wage equality also had an effect on the labor force participation of females, right? So they would, in theory, at least increase, uh, I guess most would expect. Or if you see a way in which we could endogenously change the composition of employment. So um, somehow increase the share of, of females working in an industry that is initially mostly occupied by male workers. Um, and yeah, so what I would like to understand by the end of this discussion is um, what are the good hypotheses, what are the good uh, results from the literature that we can use to understand how to um, endogenously reduce the, the wage inequality between males and females. So I, I'm sorry, there was probably a lot of, I have many more, but. Um, I guess these are the, the main things and that's what I think could probably help uh, more people you know, get, get into this world of ours, which sometimes sounds a bit strange to many others. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andre. Cem, you do what you please. You can comment on Andre lecture or maybe if intellectually it's easier maybe to manage, you can first respond to Andre and then later to comment on his lecture. I think it's up to you, whatever makes you feel more comfortable. Uh, I have one question. Should I uh, leave my comments for how to incorporate feminist and ecological models uh, for the next round or should I tell them now? How, how I, I think if you want, you can leave it for the next round. So okay. do you... What do you want to do? Do you want to maybe respond to Andres' uh, 
question first, whatever uh, you, makes you feel more yeah, comfortable. Yeah, actually, I could start with responding, Andre. It's, it's, it might be easier. Uh, thank you for the comments, Andre. I mean, there are I mean, some re very relevant comments. Uh, I mean, of course, the model has limitations. One of the limitations that I could say is we are really taking fixed uh, gender uh, 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 ratios in uh, two uh, sectors. Uh, so this is one of the limitations. I mean, we have two sectors, but yeah, I mean, the sh shares aren't changing with the uh, given shocks. Uh, in terms of marginal propensity consume, indeed, while we were doing this models, the, we started by uh, looking at the impact of gender pay gaps, gender pay ratios on uh, the output. But by, I, I guess this is uh, the, one of the use of models, like you see stuff that you don't see while you are thinking uh, without a model. Like we immediately saw, like once we started working on the model that the impact of ra rising the way female wages to level of male wages and the impact of reducing male wages to the level of female wages is something totally different in terms of the impact. So in both cases, you're reducing the gender pay gaps, but uh, once you uh, make an upward convergence in terms of the wages, this has uh, different effects compared to downward convergence. Uh, so in terms of like the uh, uh, increasing, uh, so the, the question that we were trying to answer was actually like what the impact of like increasing uh, female wages with upward convergence. Uh, the margin propensity to consume for male and female workers uh, in expenditures other than social infrastructure expenditures is pretty similar, a little higher for female workers, but it's pretty similar. So. A lot of the results that we are saying could be achieved by increasing the gender inequalities too, in the sense that you could increase the male wages while keeping the female wages constant. Uh, and uh, this would have uh, increase in, this would lead to increase in the wage shares, this would push the productivity to higher levels and so on and so forth. Uh, but one thing that might uh, differ indeed is the effects coming from the uh, public social, uh, sorry, uh, private social expenditures because female uh, workers really tend to spend more uh, in social sector, which would have different impact on productivity later. So this is one difference, I think, that I could say, uh, coming from the marginal propensity to consume. But I mean, overall, like, I think uh, the concept of like, what would happen if we reduce the gender pay gaps is a valuable thing itself, because even if it has like zero effects on growth, I mean, even if like reducing the gender pay gaps has zero effects on growth, which indeed for the UK and in another paper for Korea, we find very little effects. Uh, we find much stronger effects coming through uh, public social infrastructure. Uh, closing uh, the gender pay gaps itself is something valuable. And we basically say that you could do it without damaging the economy, indeed like slightly helping the economy. Uh, in terms of uh, other things like uh, the increase in uh, wages might uh, increase the labor force participation, you're right. I mean, we don't uh, deal with specific labor force participation in here. Uh, to simplify the model, because the model is quite uh, complicated already, but uh, you're right. I mean, this is one of the uh, things that limitations of the uh, model, I could say. Uh, in another paper that we wrote um, about Korea, though, we use a war, a war model, which at least like the wages uh, with uh, delayed shocks have uh, actually, no, not with late shock. I mean, actually, the wages are affecting employment, uh, and later employment is affecting wages. Too. So, I mean, we account for that in an empirical model. Uh, okay, uh, I, uh, let me just comment on Andreas' uh, presentation. First of all, uh, I really enjoyed the uh, 
lecture. Uh, it gives a very simple but uh, very uh, good uh, summary of stock flow of constant models and how these models could, could be applied to ecological economics. Uh, of course, the uh, good thing about uh, SFC models is it could give like the complete picture of an economy and it's valuable to have the model uh, uh, stocks and flows being uh, consistent and it's the model is easy to adjust by adding new variables. I think one of the things that is important in stock flow constant models and I think this is uh, developing. I mean, I could say the same thing, for instance, for uh, agent-based models too. Like, I mean, uh, uh, the, the parameters, uh, it would be better to like just have parameters that are eco uh, informed by empirical data, by econometrics. Uh, because one of the aims of uh, these models is uh, making simulations based on different policy shocks. What would happen if you uh, make green investment? What would happen if you uh, push for uh, green finance? But what, I mean, what are the magnitudes of these effects? Is I think something important. And uh, I think uh, uh, supporting these models with empirical and with econometrics therefore is going to be uh, something valuable. Uh, and I, I think this happening to, I mean, a, a newer paper of uh, Yanis Dafermos and Maria Nicolaidi for instance, uh, published this year in Journal of Financial Stability, uh, for instance, is uh, informed by uh, econometrics uh, for the policy shocks. Uh, that I'm sure that there are other papers that are developing, but I think that's something uh, that we should uh, consider. Uh, in terms of the uh, other paper that uh, Andre, I couldn't have much time to discuss, uh, the feasible alternatives to growth uh, paper. Uh, I mean, one comment that I could say is that it's basically uh, saying, uh, the, giving different shocks. One is like the shock coming from like for like the degrowth shock. There's also green growth shock. Uh, some of the uh, policies, for instance, uh, could be too much restricted to one specific policy. For instance, degrowth is associated with uh, wealth tax, whereas green growth is not, uh, there's no wealth tax in green growth. I mean, it's uh, kind of, uh, I mean, I'm just saying like there could be different alternatives than the uh, three, four alternatives given in the paper. Uh, and what else? Uh, and I think that's it for now. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Tim, for uh, keeping everything together. Andre, <coughs> you have the floor. Okay, so um, let's see. So first, the the actual, I think it's a calibration question in the end, right? So you have a bunch of um, behavior equations that you kind of have an idea that they, so, okay, let, let me take a step back. At some point in the lecture, I talk about um, parameter, parameter and structural uncertainty. And so, I think it wasn't very clear when we talk about sensitivity or parameter uncertainty is exactly what, what Jen just commented, commented on. So you have some fixed parameter constant that relates uh, your increasing income to your increasing consumption, for instance, marginal propensity to consume, and you want to know how large it is. For some, it's very common and you have tons of, of empirical work and for others, it's a bit uh, less clear cut to find it. And then there is, the issue, which I guess is even more complicated than that, which is what some people call structural uncertainty, which is when you have competing theories for a single behavior equation. So think about consumption again. We have the probably the most well-known one, which is Keynesian marginal propensity to consume out of disposable income. But then you have life cycle theories of consumption. Uh, you have a million ways to do consumptions moving from, from different strands of neoclassical economics. And ideally, if you are not very certain, on top of also varying the, the size and magnitude of your parameters, you would also like to test how crucial is uh, a single theoretical assumption to reach a final result. Um, what I would say is that after, 
as I tried to explain, I haven't always done this. I've been doing it, um, these ecological macro models for the last three years. And what might surprise some people is that when you actually finish a model, finish the equations and you go calibrate the model. So by calibrate, we mean we take, so for instance, our model starts in 2000 or 2010, and then we use actual data from the real world for the value of GDP, the value of consumption, the value of the Gini coefficient, coefficient for inequality, emissions, and so on, uh, from 2000 to 2020 to calibrate these parameters to make sure that at least in the period in the past up until today, you replicate, you actually manage to replicate uh, reality to some extent. And what usually comes out of this is that there is much less uh, uh, freedom, degrees of freedom than you would actually expect from a from a, um, in a simulation model, particularly because many, as you said, many of the parameters are indeed um, either known because you have surveys. For instance, the Eurostat has a survey that tells you on average. Uh, the marginal propensity to consume to remain on the same example for several countries and people of several different income quintiles. Or you can scan the literature to find uh, econometrically estimated parameters for, for some of this stuff. And that's what we usually do, by the way. So maybe not in the model that I presented because it's, uh, it was just an introduction, but usually that is the best practice. Uh, but on top of that, I think you would also like to test competing uh, theoretical hypotheses on some stuff, as I try to show with different investment functions, investment demand functions during the, the recorded class. Um, let me see if I'm not forgetting something um, before I move on to the other question. So yeah, usually you would either estimate yourself uh, or look for other empirical work that has estimated that, that sensitivity of some relation. And in the worst case scenario, which is, I have no idea, I have no data, that's tricky. Usually that's something you would like to avoid. So avoid stuff that is really uh, subjective of a doc in the model, because then, you know, it's hard to, to, to convince people that you did uh, something useful. But if you really need to do it, what, what I would do is I would use all the, in a simulation model at least, which is what I do, use all the parameter space. So let the model do all the possible simulations uh, for, the, for the parameter, I don't know, and see what happens. And that would probably give us an idea of, because we actually know in the end what behaves like a real economy and what doesn't. And in simulation models, when you go out of something, they usually do weird stuff and you know it's, it's you're not there exactly. I, I don't know, I hope it was clear enough. This is kind of what the things, uh, I sometimes do. On the on the um, feasible turns to green growth paper, um, yeah, I, I completely agree with you that there could be more um, and there could be more. So in the end, what we present is three, three different scenarios and the rationale behind it is that uh, we wanted to try to replicate what in our opinion are the three main discourses uh, that we see nowadays. So in a way, one, one scenario was meant to replicate green growth and it tries to combine um, technological incentives, uh, something that people usually, well, governments mostly rely a lot on, uh, have a lot of faith in as well, with, with market mechanisms such as carbon taxes, ETS, and so on. Then we, we had another scenario, which uh, is an attempt to replicate something that would look like a, a Green New Deal. So basically we take the same uh, bunch of green growth stuff for technology and incentives, but add social policy. So in that case, we added, um, I think a job guarantee, not for the whole population, but a pretty large one, and uh, some work in reduction, if I'm not mistaken. And then in the end, we, what in our view is the third uh, most uh, talked about, commented on alternative, which is degrowth, right? So in which we added a simulation of people voluntarily reducing their, their, their consumption. And yeah, of course there would be a million. So as you see, each of the scenarios are a combination of at least four or five policies. So, because on top of that, we have the, the, um, the environmental policies, uh, the carbon tax and so on, the, what is it called? 
the border carbon adjustment, which is when you tax the carbon content of the imports of your country, plus the variations in technology and increasing renewable energy. So the, the actual number of combination of this is infinite. And as I tried to, to explain um, during the recorded class, one of my personal opinions is that when you put too much, it becomes too much for the reader as well. So we wanted to keep it tight, trying to replicate what this, what we think it's the main alternative. Actually, we have a website in which you can access the model and you know, push your own buttons and, and choose your own combination. They can uh, send the link to everyone afterwards, but uh, choosing just these three scenarios was in, in a way more of a rhetoric uh, instrument than, than, you know, than the optimal choice. Because usually when we do uh, simulation models, uh, from a post keynesian uh, perspective, we are hardly ever thinking about optimization, but we're thinking more about the, the feasibility of, of these actions. Uh, if you want, they can go a bit more into the difference between simulation agent-based models and, and uh, mostly bottom-up uh, ge computable general equilibrium models afterwards. I hope I have answered the questions. Did I miss something, Federico? Not in my opinion, I mean, Champs would say, uh, you are right that we will be discussing in a, in a minute about the different types of uh, models. I will now give you the chance, Champ, to, if he wants to say something, and then uh, Andre again, and then I will start with the questions. Uh, thank you for the clarifications. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, I think it's great that uh, for the uh, nature sustainability paper, like there's a link that where you could uh, choose your own scenarios. I think it seems like a nice uh, fun tool to work on. Uh, uh, in terms of the empirical data, I, I understand a lot of the concerns. I mean, I'm telling that it, there's no easy way to do this, first of all, uh, especially if you are uh, having a lot of uh, equations that should be empirically informed, uh, then this means that you need to make other empirical estimations, but then uh, there are limitations of that too, because you don't have good data for everything. Uh, even if you have, sometimes you will have to use, a lot of times, uh, indeed, you will have to use yearly data, which start from, let's say, 1980s, but there might be indeed uh, structural changes that might have changed the parameters that you are using there. Uh, uh, and you have to deal with also other problems, uh, endogeneity. I understand that it's uh, it's not easy in uh, every uh, equation in every paper, uh, but I'm just saying this as an as an idea uh, to uh, support the analysis. But in terms of like uh, presenting different scenarios based on the different parameters, I think it's of course a good way to go to even if you do econometrics, it's better to like show like different. Of, uh, uh, pose more optimistic, more pessimistic scenarios, of course. Uh, okay, thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Tim. I don't know if, Andre, you have a reaction, otherwise I will start maybe with the first question. Um, sorry, I was sharing the, so I have added a link to the link to the, to the chat, sorry in which you can access, it's not the actual one, I have to find that other link, it's somewhere else. Uh, but this is the link to do the same thing, but with the Italian version of the of, of our model. Actually, I have more questions to Jan, but I think we should go uh, perhaps to, uh, I can do yeah. them later. I think it's better for the floor. Okay, so great, thanks Andre. So let's go with the first question that I think we, all have in, in mind right now is, and it's the one I already mentioned, no? How could we merge ecological and feminist uh, macroeconomic uh, models, no? And I guess if I understand correctly, I'm, I'm not an expert at all in, in models, no? Is, <coughs> could we envision models that allow us to explore the relationship between, for instance, gender wage gaps and, I don't know, energy and CO2 emissions, and the impacts of different policies regarding this issue in terms of the uh, effects on employment and, and growth, for example. No? Because all the debates we are having on green investments or social investments are very much linked to the policies that are coming now, for instance, with the Green New Deal and so on and so forth. So to read some questions from the participants related to it, um, there is one by Chem, not by Chem, by two Chem, 
uh, who uh, says, and I'm reading, can your model build scenarios with degrowth and see what happens to gender inequality and in particular gender wage gaps? Um, and I think there was another one um, which is similar again for Chem, which says, and I'm reading, I was wondering whether the model could be advanced in that way that it does not focus on GDP, but rather, for example, on the material throughput that is on the energy and, and material flows within the economy so that the growth and ecological aumens could be uh, modeled better. And along similar lines, there are questions for Andre, uh, which says, for example, the first one is, can your model integrate gender wage gaps? Um, and I think there is another one which says, I'm very interested in, and I'm reading, I'm very interested in how exactly sufficiency would be modeled inside the stock flow consistent model. Would it be simply downscaling of consumption or disaggregated into different sectors? And then we can assess the impacts of the environment, material throughput or social indicators. By sufficiency, I, I, they refer not to the proposal by the ecofeminist, which somehow uh, recalls the proposal of, of degrowth, no? like a society focused around care, for example, um, and not around uh, growth. So I think this is the first uh, block of uh, questions for you, and I think it would be great if you can uh, comment. I really have no preference for which one go first. So if anybody wants to volunteer, um, otherwise I can say. I think Cem unmuted okay, himself. So. Great. Uh, so in terms of, can we have this model uh, adapted to uh, the growth? Honestly, uh, I never, we never thought about this. I, I should say, uh, because the aim of these uh, Poskaletsky models is like just uh, by nature understanding the relationship between uh, inequalities and economic growth and growth in these models are always seen as a good thing. But uh, in our model, I could say, I, I was going, planning to say this in terms of like applying this for uh, SFC models too, but I could say this for our model. Uh, one of the very important features of our model is the purple jobs, the social infrastructure expenditures, as I explained. Uh, this is very important for uh, reducing the gender employment gaps, creating uh, gender uh, employment for female. Uh, of course, you could uh, orient the focus of the model from output to uh, female employment or like uh, overall employment. So this could be one way that you could go. And another thing is that uh, the purple jobs are also a mainly uh, compared to the rest of the economy, green jobs too. So I want to uh, share uh, something uh, in my... Uh, in my screen, do you see it? Uh, do you see the Excel? Yes, but if you can make them slightly bigger, then better. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me just zoom. Uh, why? Yes, okay. So here, for instance, this is the U on the UK data uh, based on the energy use. Uh, one of the features of uh, Andre's uh, lecture was, uh, the models in Andre's lecture was like the energy intensity was quite important uh, for uh, carbon emissions. And as you could see, like these are the purple jobs, like these are the uh, jobs in education and uh, uh, so social care and healthcare, and the amount of uh, uh, energy that's being produced. Uh, and if you look at the energy intensity for each of the sectors, uh, let me zoom this too, uh, you, you could see that uh, these jobs are also, for instance, compared to manufacturing, much more, much less energy intensive. Uh, and for instance, education sector is like, compared to the rest of the economy, uh, like 20% of uh, ener uh, to energy intensive compared to total economy. And uh, healthcare and social care is like less, maybe like 25% uh, 
of the econ uh, energy intensive compared to the rest of the economy. And compared to like manufacturing, uh, there's almost no comparison. Uh, so the point that I'm trying to get here is uh, you could definitely apply these models by considering the amount of carbon emissions too. And I mean, you could come out with outcomes saying that well, compared to, for instance, giving stimulus through another sector, giving stimulus through uh, social infrastructure, which would, could generate both uh, more female jobs and not only would generate more female jobs, it would uh, lead to less carbon emissions. So this could be maybe not the growth, but it could be an alternative growth path in the sense that we would have, I mean, having better healthcare, having better education, better care services, and of course, good for, for, that, for our own well-being, obviously. Uh, but it's also uh, might be a way to uh, create jobs, uh, create uh, output uh, uh, through like uh, through not hurting environment uh, too much. Uh, that could be one way to uh, apply. I think. Yeah, I think I think this is great, um, and it really helps. In fact, it's something that uh, we already discussed. A little bit on on Monday, um, with IPEC and and Simone, no, and IPEC was asking exactly with this idea of of social investment, no, um, whether we knew of um, papers that would review, for instance, the energy intensity of employment in different sectors, for example, no, and I mentioned there was an example I know about leisure activities. And I guess we could find something about uh, care war, no? Well, what is the energy intensity of care war, no? So I think this is is an important idea, I think, to be explored. But anyway, Andre, you you have the floor. Um, okay, I have quite a few uh, stuff to comment on. I'll try to do everything. So first of all, I'd like to do more like a, a general, if you want, economic theoretical comments on. Uh, why I think using this um, generally called heterodox, more specifically Poskanger, yeah. Poskladskian um, theoretical framework for macro, why I believe it fits ecological and, and feminist economics. I think um, we went a bit on it on the first day already, but I would like to highlight the fact that generally on for those that are economists, for those that are not, I hope it's not too boring. If you start from a typically neoclassical model, things are voluntary. So at least in the archetype ideal model, if labor force participation is lower is because females, uh, sorry, women choose to work less. If their wage is smaller, is lower is because their labor marginal labor productivity is lower than men. And of course, I'm not saying that all the neoclassical economists that do apply micro work to, to very well, by the way, to, to these topics believe in this, but they would usually on top of this ideal, uh, how the world should work model. I think someone has the, the mic on. Um, I'm sorry, is, is Roberto, Daniele, can you mute him? Thank you. So, um, and then you add imperfections, right? You add imperfections, you add um, several ways to account for these differences uh, between, between males and females that are not accounted for in the typical neoclassical model. So, in my personal opinion, I think it's a way to do it. I think there are tons of empirical work which is very, very well done and have found very good results and interesting ones. But I think it kind of neglects the structural, uh, the same goes for ecology, by the way. It's an externality. I think it's a bit more than an externality most of the times. So it kind of neglects the fact that these are more often than not very structural conditions from the way our economies and, and our society and you know, our, our relations with each other are, are structured. So th this is a very general comment on why I think heterodox in general, whichever way or side of heterodox economics you come from, um, should have an edge uh, in treating these topics of ecological and feminist economics. 
So, um, okay, on some of the comments, um, as we try to explain the lecture, so the, the model, the models I I do and the ones I use, they I know there are models that work exclusively on physical quantities, those by 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 John Piero and, and his co-authors, mostly in Barcelona. And whereas ours works on, on value, right? On prices and GDP, and not directly on total throughput. But one thing I try to highlight, and I think it's very important, is to use not a simple uh, production function, but at least the whole input output, which gives you a better idea um, of how to, of the total size of the economy, and which is probably a better way to connect with the total material extraction, uh, metal use, other, other resource use and fuels as well. Um, and on the other side, uh, compared to using only physical quantities, I think there is uh, an argument to be, to be done in favor of using, um, we're modern in economy and economy runs uh, mostly on value of stuff and prices, including and pr probably more important than, than any other the price of labor, uh, heterogeneously wages is what actually determines um, distribution. So the way in which the forces that affect the, the variations of labor prices, wages, and the way in which employers, capitalists, or whatever you want to call them, adjust prices to recover their, their profit margins after increasing labor costs or increasing other costs they have, for instance, from imported uh, goods, actually determines the income distribution, which uh, is not only relevant per se, because I think all of us want to have a less than equal society, but it, I think it's also relevant for the ecological transition in a way, because I honestly, th this is more of an opinion that, than a result, but I honestly think that it's very unlikely that we'll be able to achieve, uh, and I guess most of the lecturers in this course would agree with me, to achieve a complete overhaul of our societies, which is necessary for, for an actual ecological transition with the levels of inequality that most of the world sustains today. So I, I guess uh, having prices and value and understanding how their variation shapes income inequality in our societies is fundamental also for the um, for ecological transition, for the reduction of emissions and environmental impact in general. How to integrate gender um, wage gaps in our simulation? So I have been trying it for a while. Uh, I have a version of my model that does it by now. And uh, although it's, uh, we are trying to write, we've been trying to write something for months and one day we'll manage, but the situation is, is difficult for productivity nowadays. Um, yeah, so basically what I did is I have a labor market that starts from a picture of what it is. So we have, I don't know, in that model, I think we have like 19 industries and we know um, from the total labor demand of each industry, how much of it is from low, middle, and high skill males and females. And we start from that and, and, and go from there. And we also have the hourly wages that, that they earn. And the actually tricky part is how they move in time. So that's why I was asking Jim previously, uh, the, the kind of heroic hypothesis I make in, in, in integrating gender uh, in the labor market of my model is how do the composition of employment within an industry changes? in time. So if the unemployment rate of high skill males is very low and it's kind of scarce in a country, whereas you have a greater supply or availability of high skill females, do you change? Do you start hiring more females? In my model, I assume that, that that's how it works, but maybe that's not how it works in society, especially because we know um, a, lot of, a lot of the gender wage gap when you actually compute it is not explained by uh, having uh, a man and a woman receiving different wages for doing the exact same job. But a lot of it is explained by, by career progression, um, how you go on and how, how males actually go up the ladder within firms. And sorry, I, I'm digressing a bit too much here. And so for instance, th this is one thing that is tough for me. The other thing that is tough for me to, to model in, in a simulation model is time use. So. I assume that more females will go and join the labor market because wage increase, which I think is a reasonable assumption. But then I, I also have to assume that there is a minimum amount of, of unpaid work that has to be done 
for for the society to function either if it's elder care child care household maintenance and so on so i would have to increase male unpaid work somehow is it reasonable or is it a constraint that we should assume how fast should these things move i don't know and there's no data by the way it's very rare for time use data doesn't have the longitudinal dimension which is really pity um how to integrate sufficiency um i think correct me if i'm wrong Federica. are we talking about sufficiency in in the sense of planetary boundaries and sufficient consumption i think the participant can clarify in the chat but i think what what they refer to is sufficiency is a concept used by uh, which has been used for quite a while now by uh, ecofeminism and more recently also by civil society the organization uh, in Europe, and more or less, it's a similar idea to degrowth, um, no? to the idea of redistributing and making sure that everybody has enough. So I, in the way I understand it, it's a little bit the general research question of the summer school, how to provide a good life for all within planetary boundaries. Yes. Okay, so um, in general, I don't think it's hard to integrate limits, not hard to integrate different targets which are not consumption forever increase as much as you want increase the gdp as much as you want the, i think the really tricky part is before is understanding what is sufficiency uh what is so uh, professor julia steinberger has done great great work on that from the uh, energy demand side uh you can check her latest works with uh Yannick oswald if i'm not mistaken and I think that's that's really tricky. So maybe even the planetary boundaries are easier to to measure in a way than the sufficiency. So how much energy consumption is enough, right? Um, okay, let me not go on for too long here. I would like to add a comment to Chen's last uh, point on the social uh, sector, health and and. No, social work in general. This is very much a, an economist comment. Sorry, I keep moving, I kind of. Um, and this is part of the, the little, if you want to say that the very little neoclassical that lives in me sometimes, I think, and, and that goes in general for a discussion that was done in the first day and a discussion that is around the growth in general about let's shift uh consumption to low productivity sectors uh, let's move away from high energy demand sectors and of course I, I guess to some extent it will work but also remember that you know in general i think what counts is who owns this sector. if these are capitalist sectors and we shift all our demand to i don't know healthcare and 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 elder care and other I don't know, education and so on. In time, probably, you start to see more innovation there. You might start to see an increasing wages and a substitution of work by, by some sort of automation, at least in, to some extent, even though I understand it's harder in these industries, but it's not impossible. Like, if you think about it, the, the, the prime examples of jobs that would never be, um, automated in 2002, when the job polarization literature started, were all jobs that are now not easy, but on the verge of automation. So driving vehicles, um, law in general, even image diagnosis. Those are some of the things that machines now do better. I'm digressing again. So, but I, I think we should think more about ownership and maybe not ownership is not the best word, but how to, to structure the industries that we want to grow in, a, in an economy to reach uh, a fairer ecological transition. Because otherwise we run the risk of, uh, you know, doing all things with a good intention and ending up in a very similar situation of the one we're in right now. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, uh, Andre. I guess Cem has many comments, so I give you the word. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, sorry, last one. Uh, in terms of shifting, uh, I mean, making investment on social infrastructure, uh, 
maybe that's because of my world view, my understanding of economy, but uh, I always like, uh, when I say investing on social infrastructure, I always have like public investments on social infrastructure rather than private investment. This is a big discussion, of course, but we know from the healthcare literature that uh, public uh, healthcare is much more efficient than private healthcare. It's, if you could just look at the United States example to see this. Uh, but uh, I agree, like, I mean, as, as education uh, gets commercialized more and more, uh, there's always like a tendency for labor saving uh, technologies to come in, which might not generate uh, uh, employment as much as it can. So, uh, uh, but uh, we, we, I mean, there's a po possibility like that too. But uh, again, like, I think we should keep uh, education, healthcare uh, public. Uh, in terms of uh, other comments, uh, in terms of the uh, parameters, uh, sorry, uh, the shares of, uh, how do shares of like uh, female employment change over time with different shocks? I mean, one of the limitations of our model is of course, uh, the shares uh, don't change in different sectors, but I could comment on how, uh, these models could be extended to make it more realistic. One of the things is uh, investing in care sector, of course, frees up uh, women's time and it's quite crucial for increasing female participation of labor. I mean, if you look at the feminist literature, that's one of the main things in feminist literature, like there's massive amount of work uh, talking about that. So uh, you could implement policies like investing uh, in uh, care, which would free up time for uh, women. And uh, of course, in the model, you could incorporate that too. Uh, one limitation of this is, as Andre, Andre mentioned, is the time you surveys are usually not happening every year in most of the country. So it's really, really hard to find a long uh, 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 time series data on this, but still you could work on it and you could, and it, indeed it could be uh, also important to examine, just it's another thing to uh, the impact of uh, unpaid uh, care uh, on productivity too, which might have uh, different effects on, on uh, growth. Uh, and of course, there are other factors that could be incorporated. For instance, uh, the, we know that in the, the demand shocks, especially economic crisis, influence uh, female uh, employment uh, really badly. We see that uh, during the COVID time now, too, of course, this also is an impact of increasing care responsibilities with closing schools. Uh, lockdowns, uh, we see everywhere in the world like massive decline, specifically in the female employment. Uh, so of course there are uh, shocks uh, that would affect the shares of female employment that could be included in these models more specifically. Uh, I agree on that. In terms of uh, the uh, looking at uh, the uh, impact of green growth policies on inequality. I think this is very important issue too. And I think this is one of the uh, strengths of uh, heterodox models because heterodox models uh, usually, especially Kalitsky or many of the Stockholm constant models too, uh, sees the economy as capitalists and workers and see it doesn't dismiss the distribution problem. Why is this important? Because first of all, uh, for let's take a green growth policy or degrowth policy, let's say, uh, if uh, a degrowth policy is like really uh, damaging the uh, incomes of lower classes, uh, this is first of all, not politically feasible. I mean, a policy, a green policy, whatever it is, whether it's green growth or with carbon taxes, or is it uh, it's a direct degrowth policy overall? I mean, if it's really damaging, if it's increasing the poverty in a, in a country significantly, that government will not be elected next period. I mean, that's for sure. Uh, and of course, it's important in terms of uh, the 
uh, I mean, poverty itself, because, okay, maybe for developed countries, this might, this is still a problem, but imagine even a country like India, where poverty, extreme poverty is a big problem. I mean, you can't like just implement a pol degrowth policy or a green growth policy that would massively increase the masses in, in India. I mean, that's just, uh, just inhumane. Like you, you have to consider the distributional impacts. Uh, to make this policy feasible. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there were there was one comment that I saw on the chat uh, uh, that I want to uh, comment just briefly uh, in terms of like how uh, uh, in, in terms of how much uh, green the uh, education, healthcare, social care jobs are. Uh, I mean, the, the tables that are shown are showing uh, to overall uh, energy intensity. Of course, it doesn't account, probably it doesn't account for uh, the tools that you're using for uh, educational healthcare, but these sectors are usually uh, labor intensive sectors, much more than any other sectors. I mean, think about, forget about everything. Think about this specific lecture that we are doing. People are uh, have paid for this. There's an economic activity going on, but the input here is literally, I mean, uh, the electricity that you spend for the computers to work, that's the only energy that you're spending. The rest of the energy is like just uh, human power. Like, I mean, it's just uh, human capital. Like people, I mean, we are putting our effort skills uh, for uh, creating this uh, economic activity. And similar for universities too. For instance, people are saying, uh, well, uh, the universities uh, are, uh, have reduced costs because now we are in online education. Uh, so we have to reduce the fees now. I mean, of course, there's a truth in that, I mean, the sense that they have to reduce fees because, I mean, there's less electric consumption, the buildings are not being used, this and that. But most of the costs, I mean, anybody who would manage a university would know about the expense of university would know that most of the costs in the universities, lectures, I mean, people, the staff that's working. Uh, so these are mostly like uh, labor intensive sectors. Even if you, I, I, of course, it would be better to look uh, the real, uh, inputs by using some input output model to see how much of energy is being consumed. But even if you consider the inputs, I think uh, the, the social sector is, is uh, green, uh, I would predict. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think this is an important point that Sam has been doing, that has been done before also, for example, by uh, Tim Jackson, no? By saying that investment in the social sector, generally speaking, tend to be uh, more green. There are also work that question the idea that the service sector is carbon neutral. Obviously, it is uh, not, no, because it depends a little bit on the methodology you are used in order to account for the energy intensity of that activity, no? So in the case of this uh, activity, no, as you put as an example, should we just account the electricity that goes in in our computer? Should we also take into account um, the economic activity needed in order to train as uh, professors, the three of us? Uh, should we also take into account what we do in the money we receive from the university and so on? and so forth. I mean, things can get a little bit more complicated, but yes, generally speaking, I think that that's a fair point. So I think this first part on, on seeing how we could uh, merge uh, the concerns of your two different perspectives, I think is very important. As you were speaking, I was thinking maybe you end up writing a paper together, uh, which could be nice. Um, but I want, before going to the next uh, set of questions, which will regard the the assumption, the hypothesis uh, related to your models. I will just uh, go back a little bit to this idea of what is the objective of, uh, in terms of policy making, no? whether it is growth or degrowth. No? This issue has been quite important in the, since the beginning of the summer school, slightly because uh, obviously I'm, I've been part of this debate on whether uh, economic growth is compatible with ecological sustainability or not. And people from my community, from the ecological economics community, would tend to think that it is not, at least in industrialized countries, so that we should think of 
how we can manage an economy without growth. And this is a major concern for ecological macroeconomics. Um, this is one uh, reason of why we would want to think of how to manage an economy without growth. However, I think that there are more reasons which are not as normative as this one, if you want. In the sense that even if you think that economic growth is good, um, there are moments in which the economy is not growing. And this is the example Chen was putting of the pandemic, no? which you obviously have a demand shock. And you have to take, in, in the midterm and long term, you can try to relaunch the economy with green investments, green Keynesianism, and so on and so forth. But in the short term, governments were trying to implement policies uh, which look uh, very much in, similar to something like job guarantee, for instance, the prohibition of firms to fire people in many uh, countries, um, increasing debates over the possibility of a universal basic income, or we have been debating in the summer school the, the idea of the care income and so on and so forth. So what I want to say is that even if you like growth, it might be legitimate in terms of research question to ask how we can manage an, an economy without growth. Also because we know, also by the IMF, for example, that economies are not growing as much as they used to do. Uh, this is true, especially for mature economies, uh, but it is even the case for developing uh, uh, economies, even before the pandemic. So China and India were not growing uh, before the pandemic at 10% or more as they used to do. And these debates have been referred to as the new normal by the IMF or as the secular stagnation by Lawrence Summers and other economists and so on and so forth. Um, so one question I have is, if we want to uh, consider degrowth scenarios within your models, how can we model degrowth? I mean, how can we model uh, demand uh, shocks? I think, Andre, uh, you did it for the Nature Sustainability paper. Maybe you want to explain how you did it there and if you had ideas of how this could be done uh, differently. And I don't know if, Cem, you want to, you can say something in that, no? I understand what you say, no? That there is a tradition in economics of looking at growth as a positive uh, objective, no? To which we should be aspiring. And many times we make our arguments also from the heterodox economics to mainstream economics by saying, look, if you reduce uh, gender gaps uh, in wages, then this could promote growth. But would you imagine technically whether it would be possible to include the growth scenarios no and for example as you said no in the situation of the pandemic crisis or any uh, crisis related to demand shock there are impacts very severe on employment and especially on female employment so i think that would be interesting to explore the growth scenarios to see how for instance in um cases of demand shocks of crisis we can immediately have policies also in the short term that can counter interact these in negative impacts on female employment i don't know if, if my question is clear but i was just wanted to touch upon this point a little bit more because we've been debating a lot about it and then we can move on so i don't know if any of you wants to comment or or whoever wants to chem it's like very energetic go ahead yeah i mean in terms of that First of all, we should decide on what should be our objective. What should be our objective in policy making? I think this is important. I mean, in a in a macro, macro model, I think your objective should be reducing. It could be reducing the carbon emissions, but we don't have to necessarily uh, take the objective as reducing growth or going for negative growth rates. Uh, I mean, you could implement some scenarios, for instance, like reduce, like say, output in one sector. Let's say that impose implements uh, corporate tax uh, on one, or implement carbon tax, and try to see how much the carbon emissions are reduced. Maybe with this uh, carbon tax, you could implement another policy, like I know, it could social interest. It could be another like uh, uh, transfer that's given, maybe as a combination of these policies, you might still uh, have reduction in carbon emissions uh, without too much damaging the growth. Why am I saying this? Because the concept of the growth is, uh, oh, I'm, I'm not coming from like ecological economics background, so I, I'm more like uh, inexperienced in this, but uh, from what I see is 
the concept of the growth, if you keep it as like zero growth, let's say, or negative growth, it's not a good way to go in a poor economies, especially. Uh, uh, in the in the sense that I mean these economies have like real uh, problems I mean like massive uh, in poverty which I mean one of the objectives is that you should reduce the poverty in these countries uh, that's one in second it might not be politically feasible uh, very easily to uh, in the sense that like okay we implemented negative two percent I mean it's a growth three percent growth and uh, it's uh, it might not uh, it might basically like in in the in the UK for instance if you implement a policy like that you might lose the election next time and the third thing uh, it's uh, important is that how uh, if we are I mean select, electing uh, selecting like uh, negative growth as objective uh, it doesn't make sense because this could be happening in different ways. Like, for instance, we experienced in pandemic a massive uh, decline in output in with parts of world. Of course, there's like post environmental effects of it, but really, I mean, did, did this uh, save the world? I mean, we are, it, it also like reducing uh, carbon. How are we reducing carbon emissions? Uh, how are we reducing output is also an important question that we should answer. Again, like if I make a model, like I would make the objective function like more like a policy uh, that would uh, reduce the carbon emissions rather than gr growth itself. Uh, and I would check the impact of different policies, like again, like input doing like uh, carbon taxes, corporate taxes or wealth tax or uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, great. I'm with you on that, Cem. I think in this school, what we are trying to put at the center is, uh, if we put at the center of our macroeconomics, uh, gender equality and ecological sustainability, then what happens to the economy, no? My guess is that um, this will impact economic growth, but I'm open to that. Another framework that we are not discussing in this school, but we could have, is the one of donut economics, no? Uh, by K. Ray for who tries to I think we lost the, 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 the has social foundation uh, in terms and match this with uh, planet uh, I have a connection problem. You can just go ahead. I think uh, we we Head didn't and, hear after the Kate uh, Rob uh, the donut economics part. We lost you for a minute. Yeah, but. My connection is not great right now, but doesn't matter. You just go ahead, Andre. I'll try to be brief this time, but um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to note that it is kind of a paradox that it has to be us on average or in general from the heterodox side, we, the people that we're always against the definition of economics as the allocation of scarce resources to tell people that apparently the, the whole planet is kind of scarce in, in more than one meaningful way. Whereas, you know, the guys working on, on the classical economics, they were always, yeah, we can all never go beyond because we have to restrain ourselves to what we have. And also in the, in the macro, uh, with austerity and so on, believe that growth can go on forever. And, and it all goes to, uh, that is just to say that people from, this is kind of a good thing that I'm the one to, because being from the global south, uh, I am one of those that was very hard to convince into the growth. I have lived through, from, I've seen there are quite a few Brazilians following, if you are around my age and you have lived through the mid 2000s, it kind of feels good when things are growing. Everyone getting jobs left and right, wages increasing, people buying houses and so on. And no one in their you know, right mind would ever advocate for countries of the global south to reduce their, their income levels. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is the exact opposite is to after understanding that if we keep using natural resources and 
more, more specifically emitting CO2 at the rates uh, that we are or not reducing as fast as we should be because we are very far from it right now, the impact will fall much more heavily on those countries in the global south who would like and should grow and increase the, the average income of their of their of their citizens of, of those in the Ecuador and those are the people who will suffer the most. So I, I guess the point is understanding. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I convince myself into the whole the, the growth for the global north. And of course, together you would like to reduce uh, income inequality. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But just to be very clear, it's not, I, I don't think it is, and it should not be a denial of technology, some sort of return to nature and so on. Could be as well if you prefer, but I don't think also anyone in, in ecological economics or the growth is telling people to not invest in all the possible technology, including, so if tomorrow we learn how to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, amazing, I'm very happy for it to happen and, and whatever. Um, so just some things that I usually hear about people complaining or talking when you talk about the growth that I think are not, not don't really correspond to uh, what people actually doing research and it usually say. Um, so on the more specific question, if I want to simulate the growth in a model, so of course I mean simulate, it could be like analytical model and so on. What we had done in that paper was assume that somehow people would reduce their consumption voluntarily. Um, I guess uh, it could be okay, maybe for a very long-term thing, for the time being and for how long we have to, to reach the decarbonization we need. I, I'm not sure if it's enough. So I actually think this is a very big and, and relevant open question. How do we stop growing in a way that doesn't hurt uh, income distribution in, in the global north? One way that a lot of people point out and I have already in the past is reducing working time. Reducing working time with uh, fixed uh, hourly wages. Therefore, also a reduction in in, in monthly or, or, or yearly labor income. And the idea is that these would, on the one side, reduce total consumption, and on the other side, uh, allow people to adopt and have time to adapt to more uh, less energy intensive habits, right? So taking public transportation instead of using your car uh, and so on. Uh, I guess we would need much more than that. And I, I don't ha really have a lot of answers. Uh, and if someone wants to point to some ideas, I would be very, very happy to, to hear them. The one thing I would like to, to add, just to put the, the, the feminist and gender uh, side in it, is so I wonder, of course, consumption is uh, not an individual thing, it's much more a household uh, phenomena. But I wonder uh, how... Um, you know, the, the decrease in gender pay gap and the increase in female labor force participation would actually change consumption patterns. Uh, would that be favorable to, to reduce uh, emis emissions and energy use? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if maybe Chen has an, an idea of how you know, female-led households consume uh, and spend with respect to male uh, main earner households do. I think that is a way, that could be a way in which fostering gender equality in income uh, would, would actually uh, help us in, in reducing consumption, reducing environmental impacts in general. Yeah, that's, uh, I would leave it here for now. Great, thanks a lot for this, Andre. Apologies for my uh, connection, which was not great before. I hope it's better now. Um, so, I'll move into the, we only have half an hour left, I think. So to the second set of <clears throat> questions, um, which is generally speaking, what are the, the issue of the assumption, no? the hypothesis behind your uh, models, which has already been uh, raised and how this leads to the result. And in particular, there is a specific question by a participant I'm going to read. And it's the following, who says, 
is the econometric estimation of model parameters coefficients with historical data reasonable, given that the future we want might be radically different from the past? And thanks for the great lectures, the participant says. And she follows, are your models assuming humans to be homo economicus rational beings? If not, what are alternative ontological uh, approaches uh, to this? So I don't know if you want to make a, a short comment on, on this. Uh, okay, I could start. Uh, I mean, of course, like uh, one of the uh, limitations of any econometric estimation is that we don't know the future. I mean, you need to use past data and uh, things might change in the future. But I mean, what's the best alternative to that? Uh, I really don't know because we don't know the future. That's that's our problem. We don't know what's going to be. We didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic two, two years ago, for instance. Uh, in terms of, are, are we assuming homo economicus? Uh, no, uh, indeed, uh, that's one of the uh, theoretical differences in Potskaleski model, in most of the heterodox models, indeed, uh, where uh, you basically uh, don't bother uh, taking uh, uh, rational agent that maximizes its utility. I mean, there are a lot of like uh, theoretical explanations why we shouldn't do that. Uh, and you don't take a representative agent, but rather you focus on like aggregates. Uh, of course, like you could like have other like other like heterodox models like that could include representative agent too. But uh, the problem with uh, the the advantage of taking aggregates is that uh, you basically could see the interaction between uh, different uh, things. Uh, more clear. Uh, well, in, uh, in, I, I want to answer Andres' point uh, question, if you if you don't mind. Uh, in terms of the uh, consumption behavior of male and female uh, workers, uh, what what empirical studies find is female uh, individuals tend to spend more on the family needs, uh, the basic needs of family, children, and also more on like uh, social uh, infrastructure compared to male, where I mean, male individuals tend to spend on other things. The impact of this on, on uh, overall energy use, uh, I don't know, I mean, it might be interesting to look at it. I, just by uh, mere prediction, I would say, uh, reducing gender inequalities might reduce the energy use, but again, you have, we, have, we have to look at the data in terms of that. Uh, uh, yeah. Super, thanks a lot, Sam. Uh, Andre, you want to briefly comment on this? Let's yeah, I'll comment on keep, the same question, yeah. so. Let's try to the, keep the comments brief. So okay, on the on economics, the question is very, the, the answer is very much the same, so. My optic agents, they, they assume that the past is the best approximation for the future. When they get wrong, they correct in the next period, usually. Um, there is no predicting the future, rational expectations, knowing the model and so on. Mostly it's rule of thumbs, tacit knowledge, and, and you know, some things from the, the, the post schumpeterian literature on the, on, the, on the technology and firm side and some usual post keynesian assumptions on the consumption investment side. And um, is it reasonable to estimate parameters for the future? Uh, short answer is probably no. Um, long answer is probably no, but I, it's better than just guessing. So uh, sometimes, for instance, uh, I once did a, a model for the, the electricity market in Italy. And there, for instance, you don't really have to rely for, for production technologies, at least a lot on, on estimation because you have engineering. So you have estimations of how, from engineers of how the, the, the cost of uh, photovoltaic panels will evolve in the future or storage technologies and so on. So we can get some stuff from that. And so just to finish, I think one, the, the best practice in my own opinion is use parameters estimated with factual data from the past and then if you're going to project a long time into the future, let, let them change and see, simulate 5,000 times and find those simulations that take you where you want to be in a society with 
less emissions and less uh, uh, inequality and see what takes you there. That it becomes a, a different kind of thing. It's not you predicting the future, but telling, look, if you have a policy that can transform the, um, I don't know, reduce capital depreciation, we, we are more likely to achieve uh, a fair, fairer transition to, to a low carbon economy. So that's, these are some of the things that I do sometimes. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Andre. <clears throat> so then um, the next set of questions um, relate a little bit to the issue of the different types of modeling which you have already commented, but if you want to add something on this, you are welcome. In particular, there is a general question for both, which is the following, and I'm reading. Agent-based modeling was mentioned a few times as a side note in lecture and also in the literature for the summer school. Where do you see the most important role of these models for ecological and feminist macroeconomics? And then there is a question specific for Andre, but could be uh, relevant, I think, also for Cem, is, and I read, I've made the experience that some mainstream model, modelers who work on climate change are actually quite interested in other types of modeling. However, for many, there seems to be a strong path dependence, especially after working with these uh, big integrated assessment models. What is your experience? And do you think it would be useful uh, to build more bridges between different mo modeling communities? Again, this is for Andre, but I think if you substitute uh, climate change to gender equality, then it's probably relevant also for uh, for Chen. So whoever wants to go first, you're welcome. Chen, if you want to go? Uh, yeah, I could, I could go. Uh, I mean, in terms of agent-based models, I think the advantage of agent-based models uh, compared to any other models is that you could make the models more complicated. You could like uh, take into account uh, many, many different behavioral equations uh, and solve the uh, system based on that, uh, which might of course have a value. Uh, in terms of incorporating different types of frameworks, uh, I mean, of course, like there could be like different types of frameworks. I mean, mainstream neoclassical framework that could be implemented or at least intuitions coming from uh, different types of frameworks. But uh, there's a methodological difference between taking uh, individuals acting rationally, maximizing their utility and not bothering about that. Uh, so there you're making a choice, I think, whether you want to have uh, rational individuals or bounded rational individuals or individuals that you don't bother about rationality. Uh, you could do either of them, but you can't do all of them at the same time very easily. Uh, Excellent. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tim. And Should I go now? Yeah, okay. Um, so, Agent-based models in general. So let me just be very clear. What I, I tried to explain during the recording, my models are what people sometimes call system dynamics models. And specifically what they are is a particular case of agent-based models. So it's the same technique behind, but you don't have the agents. You just have the interaction between the aggregates. And I think the the relevance of the agent-based models, as I tried to explain during the last part of the recording is, comes in when you want to either find an emerging property or where heterogeneity is very relevant for you. So for instance, if, if it's very relevant for you to understand how firm market concentration affects the economy, then I think you know using my model with the aggregate for 10, 19, 20, how many sectors, is uh, qualitatively inferior to having, uh, I don't know, a million, a hundred thousand firms that evolve and some of them grow endogenously in your model and become monopolists or duopolists or whatever. From that, what I would tell maybe some people here know, others might have never heard is that usually um, in economics, it's always a macro model, the agent based, right? It's, a, it's usually also a stock flow, macro models, a glucose system and so on. Uh, sociologists 
tend to do a different, sometimes better job using agent-based models for other stuff. There are plenty of uh, agent-based models to understand education in sociology, for, for instance. Um, for those interested in that, I would suggest taking a look at the, a journal called JAS, which stands for the Journal of Artificial Societies and Social Simulation, if I'm not mistaken. Very interesting, a lot of different application of models of that kind, not necessarily for environment and, and macro. And yeah, so I think the, the use of ABM has to do with the thing you want to understand. If there's a lot of heterogeneity if an emerging property from heterogeneous agents uh, is relevant to answer your question, then that's probably the best way to go. And for mainstream modelers want to use different things, I think IM in general stands for integrated assessment model. And it doesn't necessarily has to be a, usually is almost always, but it, it's not always a computable general equilibrium model. Um, for instance, there is the, the C roads and the in ro N roads, stands for energy roads model from the MIT. They are system dynamics models and uh, do, I'll do a bit of an ad here. There is the, the locomotion model, the William model, which we're doing inside the locomotion project, which is a, a Horizon 2020 project. Um, we are trying to develop um, an IEM, which is not a computable general equilibrium model. You may check the website, just look for locomotion age 2020, and there is some stuff there already. The model is not ready yet. Um, but I, what I would say is that there is a role for everything. So computable general equilibrium models are usually very good when you need a lot of detail in technology. So if you want to optimize and find out what the least costly system with 30 different production technologies in energy, maybe it will give you good insights, but then it will not tell you how the system will evolve. I guess things are changing and those in the mainstream wanting to, to go into other types of model can check our work, can check the agent-based models that are being used in the Bank of England nowadays. And uh, apparently the, the Bank of Italy is trying to use a stop flow consistent model or if you want to go into econometrics, um, there is the, um, the FAIR model by Ray FAIR, which is a large uh, econometric model for the, the US economy. I think there are plenty of alternatives. And yeah, I hope I didn't take too long for that and answer the question. Oh, great. Thanks. <clears throat> so we are going towards the end um, of the session. And I'm going to raise now. Uh, a set of questions related to the possible uh, limitations of this model. And in particular, I want to read the question that has received the most likes uh, here in the Q&A uh, session in Zoom. I'm going to read it for both. <clears throat> it's a simple question, but it's an, it's, a not, uh, it's an important question. And I read, how do you decide it's time to build a new model rather than using an existing one? How do you decide the model is good enough for your uh, purpose? So <clears throat> keeping in mind this question, and I'm, I'm going to read a few more questions, which are specific to one of the uh, two, which I think you can take into account if you want in the response you give to this more general question. In particular, there is a, a question on the non-market non aspect, no? on how to include them in the models. For example, there's one person who asked, how can we include cultural aspects, value and cultural good? This is a similar logic applicable as with natural good with estimation on pressures and contribution. I think the participant says culture and nature shall be integrally uh, included, end of the quote. And then there are <clears throat> two questions for Cem and one for Andre. I'm reading these now because I think it, they are related to the more general one. For Cem and I read, could you please speak to what could more radical feminist indicators in such model be beyond gendering wage? And how could this be integrated to or plan to ensure intersectional justice? And then what are the limitations in including gendering modeling as a binary concept when we know from the real world that this is not how people live and define themselves? Maybe thinking in this by way is a limitation to achieve a more feminist uh, society. And the specific question for Andre, which is very specific and I read, is the material stock and the monetary capital stock link in your uh, model. 
So again, keep in mind as the more general question, how do you decide it's time to build a new model? And maybe these other indications as uh, examples no, of challenges for the future or limitation of current uh, models. Um, yeah. And then we will probably do, uh, yeah, this is probably the last round or so. Maybe a next one on policy making if there is time. Uh, who wants to go first? I don't mind. I uh, Tim, go. great. I, I could go first. I mean, how do you know that it's time to build a new model rather than the existing ones? Uh, I mean, from my perspective, uh, I'm. I'm trained as an heterodox economist. Uh, I got a degree from UMass Summers. So I'm working in University of Greenwich now. And uh, honestly, like uh, I, from where I look at the economy is that the mainstream you know, classical models that are based on rational uh, representative agents have a lot of limitations. And as an alternative to that, there are different frameworks developing Marxist, post Keynesian, and so on, and post Kaleski, and so on and so forth. Uh, and when you look at these frameworks, uh, I mean, this which I'm specializing, what I see is uh, they lose a lot from scale in the sense that there's only, unfortunately, very limited uh, number of departments focusing on these. Uh, uh, work. So there are a lot of things that are unexplored in, in, in these types of models. So look, at why do I go for gendered macroeconomic models using Neokoletskian uh, perspective? Because they were very limited. There were very few ones, really, uh, by the time that we started this project. I mean, there are, of course, uh, a lot of valuable people like that are the work on structuralist models like uh, Brownstein, Tavani, uh, uh, and I mean, the other people like Segu, you know, like and, and Nancy Forbre, like and many heterodox economists. But this field is really like un, uh, unexplored, and I think new tools would uh, 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 contribute uh, to the literature in that sense. Uh, in terms of the impact of value and cultural good. Uh, well, I mean, of course, uh, we, I mean, I have to say one thing, and one disadvantage of working with models, and this also applies to the question that relates to the using gender as a binary concept, you have to make simplifications. I mean, you have to impose some conditions, some rules for behaviors of some people, otherwise you can't understand the world very easily. So, I mean, make using gender as a binary concept, yes, I mean, it's a limitation, but uh, I don't know what the alternative is. I mean, you could make the, uh, gender, different genders, behavior changing. Uh, but again, like there will always be a limitation of using a model. I mean, model is really good for in terms of like push seeing the analytical relationships, analytical reason between uh, the variables, but you have to make uh, simplifications at some point, uh, either little or a lot. Uh, in terms of implementing like, in, uh, value and cultural good, like, of course, how we could, this could be reflected is that due to change in the culture or patriarchal society, there might be changes in, uh, in uh, the female participation of labor, female employment, which might have different effects uh, on the uh, employment and output. This could come as a shock, for instance. Uh, what could be the more famous indicators that could be in, in incorporated in the models in addition. Uh, I think one of the things that, especially that we don't do with empirical data due to data limitations, but this is of course uh, very important. And if you look at the work of uh, Brownstein, uh, uh, Ravan, Savani, I mean, they, they, they have like stuff that focusing on that is like unpaid care work. I think that could be more uh, further uh, feminist uh, part of the uh, story and uh, you could also check like how different uh, uh, indicators would affect the sh uh, share how unpaid care work would also be shared which could be incorporated in these models too uh, and you could see the impact of like how ch changes in different unpaid care work share is affecting the economy so 
Fantastic. Thanks. This sounds like another good idea as, uh, for a paper between the two of you <laughs> on unpaid care work. I think uh, Andre and Simone and colleagues have been uh, also working on this. Uh, Andre, maybe a short comment on, on the question. Um, okay, let me try to address. So I wanted to make a final point before, which is I think models have a role in general to be used in civil society beyond their actual role, beyond answering the specific questions that they are built to, to answer in a scientific paper or report and so on. Usually you see the firms, consulting firms or governments, they show up with 50 people that made a huge model and this is the truth, right, for them. And I feel that usually on the other side, either organized civil society or NGOs and cities and so on, they, they, they lack the same firepower to, to counter back. Because if they scan the literature, they'll probably find models that were done, but they're similar to the questions that, and the arguments that they would like to, to counter. So I think there is a, a greater role in, in the usage of model by organized civil, civil society in general. Um, okay, so apart from that, how to build a new model, use another. Usually, if you want to answer a question that no model answers, or that you think answers in the wrong way, um, it's a good indication that it's time to build a new one. You might want to build a new one just because you want to, because you want to learn how to do it. It's also, I think, valid. And um, yeah, that, that, that's the, the simple answer, I would say. Um, of course, when you go to for ecological macro, perhaps not, so, for instance, let me give an example. The reason why we build a model here is because we thought that the ecological macro models that were around um, were not uh, complex enough. So they don't have enough heterogeneity and we're not able to explore income inequality outcomes. So we thought it was a valid question to build a model and ecological macro, but even more so in the integrated assessment models, the investment is large. And uh, so it has to be considered the time you have to, to spend sometimes years to build. Um, how to include cultural aspects? I would say that they are, of course, very hard to predict. Sometimes we don't really have reliable data to understand some stuff. What I would do usually is build two scenarios. Um, in the case of simulation models, simulate the model with the world disease and now simulate it again if consumption totally shifted from meat to, to, vegetar to a vegetarian diet, for instance. And then instead of Again, predicting the future, you say, no, look, according to our model, if we manage to do this shift in culture, in preferences or whatever, we would be able to achieve these results or no, or maybe we find a barrier that, that would cause a problem. And finally, on the connection between material monetary stock. So no, my actual model doesn't have material stock because we just wanted to look more at the social side or I mean, effects of Environmental policies. The one I presented, um, I'm not sure, but what I would say is that probably you wouldn't have the whole material stock of copper, for instance, in, in, in as a monetary stock, but what you would have is like a rate of discovery of new deposits, and as in the original the Fermos model. And once these other these are discovered, they are part of the capital stock of a firm in real life, actually, by the way, uh, or of a government could be as well. And that, yeah, that would be the, the way probably. You have a rate of discovery of these natural stocks in which they are appropriated by either a government or a firm and then they become also an economic stock. That's it, thank you. Great, so we are coming to the end. I would invite uh, each of you, if you want to share a take home message um, for the participant. I think I'm very thankful. I think you have guided us through a, uh, uh, topic modeling that tends to be quite uh, technical and I think difficult uh, to digest from um, non-experts and especially non-economists. And I think you did a great job. So thanks a lot. I agree with Cem that I see the potential of uh, models for us to better understand the analytical relationship no, between uh, different variables. Um, I think we have been able to explore also how we could bridge uh, the issue of gender equality and ecological sustainability in these uh, models. So I let you uh, give a last uh, short message. If I can suggest, I think I was gonna ask something uh, regarding the 
policy relevance of your models. I think uh, uh, Andre just uh, commented on that. Maybe maybe Chem also wants to say something. And uh, instead for Andre, you already uh, made a reference before uh, to the issue of the Global South because you are from Brazil. But then maybe if you want to add the last message uh, on what could be the relevance of these models for the Global South, how they could be adapted. There was one participant asking, for instance, for the case of countries in Latin America, and I know you are interested in this, so maybe you want to make a last uh, comment. Obviously, Cem can comment too on the Global South and Andre too on, on policy making if you wish to do so. Just a last uh, statement and then we close. Maybe Cem first and then Andre to follow the tradition. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, um, in terms of like our models, I think that in terms of policy implications, uh, this of course differ would in different uh, cases, but we see that uh, this generation of purple jobs are indeed good for growth and employment. Uh, uh, this could be, of course, this might be more like relevant for even green growth. Uh, in turn, and uh, closing gender pay gaps doesn't necessarily incre by increasing female wages doesn't necessarily damage the economy. It could be sustainable. Uh, in terms of the effects on uh, global south, uh, these actually. Uh, is very important uh, because in many of the countries that associated with the global south, there's both uh, gender inequality, both in terms of employment and in terms of wages. Uh, so I think uh, our framework has good implications that could be implemented to the global south too. Indeed, uh, the uh, story uh, that we say for uh, social infrastructure expenditure indeed applies to in their empirical work. Uh, the Korea, who used to be a developing country back in the 70s uh, throughout their development uh, process. Uh, but I think there could be like different applications of it on different uh, uh, developing economies that would give uh, similar results. Thanks a lot, Cem. Uh, Andre? Last message. Okay, uh, so we are a bit beyond. Just to close, I'd like to remind you again, if I didn't manage to answer your questions, uh, I'll try to go through all of them if you manage to post in Slack, maybe in this lecture. And maybe we keep the channels open for those interested. I think it would be, I would be interested, uh, definitely. Um, okay, about Global South and monitoring, what I would say, it's less than an application, more of a suggestion is, you're probably on average young, even younger than me, not that I'm very young anymore, but still. Um, so my urge would be start doing it. If you're interested, go through the list that I posted, find a software that works for you, download a simple model, see how it works and start doing it. Because right now what we have, especially in, in integrated assessment models, but also to some extent in ecological macro models is a monopoly of models developed in Europe, US, maybe some in, in, in Japan and richer countries of Asia. And uh, having more, more diversity in the people producing the models, um, choosing the assumptions, building the scenarios, uh, I think would add a lot to the literature. And if ecological macro, ecological economics in general had more relevant models coming from, from the global south and developing countries, uh, developing I don't like because it implies that you will develop and it's unfortunately not clear um, that it will happen to, to most of our countries um, in, in the current state we're in. So do it yourself uh, or get together with colleagues of your university work. And I think it would be highly beneficial for ecological economics in general to have more models being produced in, in the global south with respect to the situation we have now. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, Cem and, and Andre for being here uh, today. I really appreciated um, your participation and your engagement and your commitment. I know you have worked a lot uh, to prepare and record the lectures and it has been really great uh, being with you today. And I think this will be very important for the participants and also for the people that will watch this session in the future, which we will make freely available on YouTube. So we hope this is just the start of a long time uh, collaboration among all of us to build a 
feminist ecological macroeconomics. So thanks a lot and have a nice day.